Hello, Internet. Welcome here. We're glad for you. When I was in South Africa, you know, this is beginning to sound like Rhodesia. You know, we used to call them the win wees when we were in Rhodesia. And it's just a joke. Uh, but when I was in South Africa earlier this year, uh, we went to the farm, to a farm in the Kalahari. And uh, we recorded quite a few people, the videos, some of you have seen, a lot of them you will still have to see in the future. But we were not alone. There were actually uh, people there from KwaZulu Natal government, specifically in the form of uh, Reinhard Hartzenberg. And they've got a wonderful program going where they record people of all colors, all tribes, all everything, where they don't discriminate at all. And then these people tell them their story. And then it goes into an archive for future historians to use or people who want to see it. And we were very grateful for uh, Reinhard there because he's an expert cameraman, sound man, got fantastic equipment, of course. And he was kind enough to take me and Papa Whiskey, that is um, Peter Williams, as well as Peter McRae and myself. He was kind enough to drive us all the way from Durban to the, to the Kalahari Desert, which you can think is, is quite a trip. And we had a lot of fun on the way. And so while Andrew and myself was recording uh, some people, Reinhardt was recording as well. And now they've kindly uh, gave us access to their recordings. And this is what this coming video is about. Now, it might be in Afrikaans, it might be in English, uh, but it's very well done. Uh, some of them you might have seen before uh, on Legacy, where we made double interviews. Uh, but, you know, no interview is ever the same. Uh, conversation is, is always different because there's some different aspects. So, yeah, here they are. Um, have a look. And then in the, in the description, I will leave a link to this remarkable uh, place where you can go and look at many, many thousands of other recordings as well and see if you can uh, support these people. You know, we always anti-government. You know, whatever they do, we say is nonsense, and mostly that's true. Uh, but yes, one of the efforts which I actually, I think, praiseworthy and, and should be continued. It's today, the 24th of March. Um, 2023, we're here at Eitvlug on the lodge here on the farm near um, in the Northern Cape. And I'm doing an interview today with Neil Wallace, that was a Puma pilot. So maybe let's start, maybe tell me about your early life and where were you born and let's just get context in that matter. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um, I was a uh, Joburg born and bred, recently at high school. And um, what year? 1977, matriculated, called up to the Navy for National Service. I went to Soldana Bay for my basics and then they uh, requested volunteers to go to the Navy Divers course, which I uh, fortunately passed the selection process and then completed the Navy Divers course in July uh, 1978. But uh, much to the frustration of the officer commanding of uh, the Navy Diver School had already applied to become a pilot in South African Air Fo in the South African Air Force, and was called up in September 1978, and um, passed the selection process for the Air Force, and started my flying training. Uh, was on Pumas or no? So the initial course in the Air Force in those days was 125 flying hours on a Harvard aircraft with a big radial engine, and then we went to Longaban. Uh, to fly the two-seater Impala Mark I and uh, graduated uh, as a Air Force pilot in 1980 in March and I went straight from there to Air Force Base Petersburg and um, did the uh, advanced training school at um, Petersburg on Impala Mark II which is the ground attack uh, aircraft Mark II. Um, served 18 months at 6th Squadron in Port Elizabeth and then I asked the officer commanding there if I could be remastered to fly helicopters instead of going to the Mirage route. 
So in end of 1981, I did the Alouette conversion in Port Elizabeth and then uh, moved up to Air Force Base SWAT Corps where I uh, qualified as a Puma pilot in March 1982. So as a Puma pilot, you'd spend about four to five months a year in the operational area, either at Air Force Base or Dungwa or Rundu, which I did for many years uh, before I moved down to Cape Town in 1985, where um, a lot of our work with the helicopters was in support of the Department of Environmental Affairs on the SA Gallus, uh, down to Marion Island, Gough Island, Tristan de Kuna, and Antarctica, and supporting all the scientists that uh, needed to be flown around those various islands and, and the Antarctic itself. Okay, and I mean, obviously, there's a big difference between fixed wing and chopper and that. I mean, I'm assuming you're you wanting to be transferred to, to chopper. I mean, you had a love or you preferred that, but maybe tell us, I mean... Why did I change over from... Well, the difference, fixed even maybe, I mean, I'm quite interested in uh, aviation as well. So, but I would love mm. to find out more about, I mean, from, from a pilot's perspective, mm. the, the differences and the likes and dislikes probably. I'm not quite sure why I suddenly made that decision in 1981 um, from an aviation point of view. I think it was more of a social point of view that I really enjoyed the work that the helicopters were doing up in the operational area as well as uh, at home search and rescue and mountain rescue and so on that they were um, helping the community. Um, it wasn't actually from an aviation point of view that I wanted to fly helicopters. I think it was the activity mm. and the lifestyle as well. Um, and uh, meeting very interesting people and going to extremely interesting places. And every single time we uh, went flying or uh, we went on missions that was to a different place in the world or Southern Africa. Okay. <coughs> Maybe give us some, I mean, if you want to talk of some of the missions or memorable moments, or I mean, we can even start with your your more earlier um, time in the, in yeah, the Army. Uh, yeah, um, as an Impala pilot, I only did two operational tours, uh, one at Air Force Base Malpacha and then one at Air Force Base on Dangwa, where the real hot action was taking place. Um, I didn't do anything... Uh, brave or serious as an Impala pilot. Um, helicopter pilots in operational area is a different ball game altogether. Mm. And I uh, had some very nasty incidents. Um, there was an operation in 1982 called uh, Ops Meobos. And um, we had eight Puma helicopters flying into Angola every day. And we were, I was number five in the formation for about three weeks before the 9th of August. And uh, on the 9th of August, we were doing a big deployment of parabats from a helicopter admin area just to the east of Kuvala, which is about 140 kilometers into Angola. And that particular day, <coughs> excuse me, I was moved from number five in the formation to number seven in the formation because. Uh, one of the aircraft was fitted with a more advanced navigation system and they, the leader of the formation asked um, the John Twaddle to move to number 5 position and he moved me to number 7. Okay. And uh, just before we got airborne, each helicopter had uh, between 12 and 14 parabats on board. And uh, John Twaddle was in front of me, all the aircraft were started up, rotors turning, ready to take off. And I said to John, I noticed you got a C model Puma. So which he agreed. And the C model Puma was the least powerful of the three versions that we had. We had the C, H and L model Pumas. And the C model had the weak, very weak engines uh, and steel blades. The H model had the more powerful engines, same blades. And the L model had the more powerful engines and uh, better um, high performance blades. So I asked John on the radio uh, how many troops he had on board, uh, parabats, and he said he's got 14, and I said, well, I've got 12, and you've got a C-model Puma, and I've got an H-model Puma, send two chaps, two of your parabats to my aircraft, which he did. They jumped out, one out of each door, came past me and climbed into our helicopter, and um, we got airborne, and 12 minutes later, he was shot out of the sky. 
which was quite dramatic because it was 400 meters in front of me. The aircraft burst into flames before it hit the trees, mm. and all on board were killed. Can you maybe explain the situation or the background around? I mean, I've heard a little bit of this uh, last Saturday when mm. we got together, so there's a whole but maybe the context of how that happened and what what place that situation. Well, yeah, there's a little bit more to it, and as far as um, uh, one of the reconnaissance guys was withdrawn, was with uplifted that morning from an area just to the north of this terrorist camp that we had flown over, and he uh, informed the colonel who was in charge of the whole operation that the helicopters must not fly over that area, and we weren't told that. And so when we drew our uh, lines on our maps to navigate from the helicopter admin area to the target area. Mm -hmm. The track went straight over this camp. And in the camp there were a good few hundred uh, Swapa terrorists plus a, a battery of 14.5 mm anti-aircraft cannons, guns. And when we flew over them, they waited for the fifth helicopter. So two gunships went initially. And then when the 5th Puma went over, they shot, targeted all the anti-aircraft guns, targeted the one Puma, which was 400 meters in front of me. And I saw him pitching up, rolling over, bursting into flames and plummeting into the trees. Uh, we all returned to the HAG, the helicopter admin area, and one of those special forces guys came to me and he said, show me on the map where this happened. And I showed him and he threw his hands up and he said, but I told the colonel they mustn't fly over there, but it was too late then. Mm. 15, 12 parabats and three mm. Air Force guys were um, killed that day. Yeah, it must have caused a big situation, I'm sure, back then was trying to explain. And, you know. See, the big problem was that they didn't know who, who was in that helicopter. And um, so all the parabats in the area had to be withdrawn and the names recorded so that they could try and work out who the 12 were that were um, killed in that helicopter because it was burnt to an absolute cinder so they couldn't identify the bodies either mm. Which, and then so we would withdraw um, the parabats from 150 kilometers in Angola back to Force Base on Dungwa and then have new parabats taken in to relieve them mm. which took a good few days to get everybody out do you know anything about the recovery process? I'm assuming there would have been a process to try and go and survey and recover. Well, 6-1 Mech, mechanized unit were there within hours and uh, they still found a lot of the bodies that had been thrown out of the helicopter and that were lying there, the charred wreck of the aircraft, which was all loaded up onto a, a big truck and brought back to Namibia, southwest then. There was a huge follow-up operation. Obviously, all those terrorists ran like crazy to the northwest and followed by the South African troops, and there was huge contact the next day with um, gunships and mirages and various things bombing them. So it created a, a lot of excitement, if you could call it that. Mm -hmm. So that was just the 1982. In 1980, uh, 1983, uh, we had uh, Ops Ascari, which was burst virtually in the same area, Kubala Techimatet, huge um, contacts with Swapa and Poplar troops at that stage. Mm. And that was shortly followed by um, the Joint Monitoring Commission with the withdrawal of South African troops out of Angola, which I was very involved with, being positioned in Angola with a, a Puma helicopter. And they had an MI-8 helicopter and then monitored the whole withdrawal of the South African troops out of Angola. Mm. So, I mean, I can just imagine, I mean, the responsibility that one must feel being a chopper pilot and having responsibility for, for people in the back. I mean, it's not just like you're a Mirage pilot and taking the responsibility just for yourself. Look, a lot of people have asked me that, especially in my later years of my career when I was a uh, Boeing 747-400 uh, pilot and Airbus pilot. Um, the pilot actually looks after himself. So he's not going to do anything <laughs> stupid in the aircraft to hurt himself. Mm. That's primary objective. And obviously my crew are very important. And then comes the airplane. Yeah. Airplanes um, 
highly sought after, very expensive possession of the state. And then anybody who's sitting in the back will surely be safe. That's how I look yeah, at it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, tell me, I mean, the bases that you operated with and what was the normal routine around maybe, I mean, how involved one gets with the, the chopper and, I mean, looking, I mean, it becomes almost mm. like a baby. I, I'm assuming either the chopper is assigned mm. to you or how does it work on rotation? Yeah, well, you spend a month at a time, normally a month, uh, at the op in the operational area and then you go back to base, which was our Air Force Base SWAT Corps which was our home base, and that would be maybe for a month or two. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you're in the operational area, you were assigned a co-pilot and a flight engineer and an aircraft, a specific Puma. That was what I was current on at that stage, and that was the aircraft and crew you stayed with for the, the mm -hmm. 30 days that you were in the operational area. Mm -hmm. And was that the, the basis that you deployed upon uh, in Angola? Was you see, those changed all, all the time. So our main base was at northern uh, southwest Namibia now, uh, Air Force Base on Dangwa. But we moved our bases according to the Army's movement in southern Angola. So wherever they were, we used to operate into that area, refuel the helicopters mm -hmm. and then move um, troops, special forces and parabets around the operational area, uh, chasing swap or terrorists. But uh, in 1980. In beginning of 1985, I moved to Cape Town, and um, we operated with the SA Navy on the uh, SAS Tafelberg, which is a big replenishment ship that had mm -hmm. uh, two uh, landing pads on the in the middle of the ship with two hangars. So we were deployed um, reasonably regularly uh, onto the ship in support of special forces or operations that were land-based. And we'd sail up Angola or the Mozambique coast and be on standby for any incidents to be able to uh, fly to the shore and pick up uh, injured troops or to deploy special forces guys off the SAS Tafelberg. Mainly night operations. But also at 30 Squadron, we um, were seconded to the Department of Environmental Affairs and um, used to fly off the SA, the SA Agalis, which was a scientific research ship. Um, in fact, I did more time on the SA Gullis than I did on the SA Tafelberg, being a civilian, more time with the civilians, mm. and that's what this orange overall is for next to me here. That was our um, luminous, if you could call it that, mm. orange overall, so that if you did uh, yeah. fall in the sea, they'd be able to see you quite easily. Mm. So we were supporting environmental affairs um, at Gough Island, and then did some work off Tristan de Kuna, Marion Island, and then I spent two tours over uh, taking the new team down to Antarctica, the Sanai Bay, South African National Antarctic Expedition, which mm -hmm. were uh, almost three month uh, tours at a time. Sure. Yeah, sorry, we, we back now and then, but so maybe let me mm -hmm. just rephrase that question because you were mentioning um, night flying on, on the Puma. And I mean, mm. this is, I mean, in the 80s and that, um, so before. Advanced avionics and that. Uh, was it an easy aircraft to fly at, at night and what would make it easy or difficult? Yeah, it was a fully instrument rated uh, yeah. helicopter with proper uh, artificial horizon, vertical speed okay. indicator, altimeter, airspeed indicator, obviously. And uh, yeah, we used to do a lot of uh, night flying training and um, quite a lot of flying off the SS Tafelberg at night out to sea, which was mm. quite challenging because your reference to the horizon is is pretty limited, especially when there's no moon, mm. uh, and you have to rely on instruments extensively uh, mm. during those operations. You were talking about, a, I mean, mm. chopper being challenging, especially in in the bush and in mm. active operations and that. So, I mean, maybe if you can expand on that, what what were you? Um, look, there are a lot of moving parts mm. uh, in a helicopter, and to fly a helicopter. Uh, you need both hands and both feet uh, to be coordinated and eyes and feel and bum and everything like that to to move, maneuver the aircraft around. And every approach and landing that you do is different in a helicopter. The wind's coming from a different direction, especially in the operational area. Your landing zone is different, different slopes, different approaches. Coming in from high, landing um, over very large trees that... Um, it made uh, life quite exciting. Mm. Um, flying off ships 
was a different ball game altogether. Um, the SA Gallus uh, was a scientific research ship mainly designed to go to Antarctica. Mm. It wasn't a um, icebreaker; it was an ice separator they called it. But so it didn't have any of those fins that stabilise ships. So it used to roll extensively. So flight operations off the SA Gallus um, with a rolling deck was very challenging. You relied on your flight deck officer, who was a chap who stood there with the, mm. the two bats to assess the movement of the of the heli deck and then to call you in to come and land and told you exactly when to land on the ship according to the role of the of the ship. Mm. But um, the night operations off the SS Tafelberg were very interesting um, but mainly the last section of the approach was always visual. So you'd fly over the ship and then we had a pattern mm. to to uh, fly in to come and beam the ship and then everything was visual on the ship and you'd uh, air taxi the aircraft over to the side and land on the ship. Obviously, being a much larger ship, its role uh, wasn't anything like the SA, uh, the SA Gallus mm. scientific research ship, and it had a much bigger heli deck. Yeah, a little bit easier, but still difficult. Yeah. Um, did you ever was did you ever draw a lot of um, small arms fire? I mean, what? Maybe just explain the the situation, or I mean, the daily flying in that. I mean. I mean, it was quite a, a very safe, reliable um, aircraft, but... Look, uh, everything changes when somebody tries to kill you, and uh, when somebody's trying to shoot at you, uh, yeah, it does get your attention somewhat. Um, and a lot of our work that we uh, did with the, SA, with the Puma aircraft was in support of Special Forces, mm. and not only in the operational area in uh, northern of southern Angola. Uh, we also did quite a bit of work internally. Um, uh, I was involved with the operation in March 1982 uh, into Masiru when the SADF were attacking the ANC uh, bases in Masiru and uh, a couple of our troops were injured there and I went into the mountains to recover these guys, uh, to extract them and um, my aircraft was severely damaged uh, by Lesotho Defence Force um, troops that were on the ground there, mm. um, put a number of holes in our aircraft. Uh, in the operational area, most of the time we didn't know when we were being shot at. Um, we'd uh, return to base and find the odd AK-47 hole <laughs> in the aircraft. But in big operations like Mirbos and Ascari, every now and again you did very well know that you were being <laughs> shot at. No. There's the round, uh, the, the bullet goes supersonic and you can, you can hear it coming past you. Yeah. Sure, no, it's been hair um, just to think about it. I had a very interesting um, incident at uh, Gough Island when we went down uh, to Gough to support the, the scientific research team there. Um, while we were off uh, Gough Island, the captain of the ship then uh, was attempting to refuel the island with diesel, obviously pumped off the ship with a very large diameter, I think it was about a five inch diameter pipe of about 500 meters long. Um, and somehow by hook or by crook, he managed to entangle the prop with this pipe. And the pipe went and got stuck around the prop. But uh, being an ex Navy diver, I had my equipment on board purely to do some social diving while we were spending the five weeks at Gough Island. And um, the other Puma pilot was also a diver, and he had his equipment with him as well, old Kevin Fullion. And the captain came to the two of us, the two helicopter pilots on board, with his hat in hand and said, would you mind trying to rescue this ship we stricken? We're a thousand nautical miles away from Cape Town. Uh, would you mind diving and taking this pipe off? Which we did over two days, shark-infested sea, and... Um, um, 8 degrees centigrade so it was rather chilly and eventually we ran out of air and the second day I went down just free diving down to the prop and eventually we got the pipe off. What depth was it? Uh, it was just below the ship so it was at about 15 feet, okay. 5 meters but both of us were awarded the Southern Cross Medal uh, for our rescuing of the ship if you could call it Oh, Tell me about your Navy diving. I mean, that's quite unique. And I know Peter has just said that. I mean, you're probably the only person that's got that, the Navy, uh, the diving element to it. Yeah. For, for 
Well, that pilots. was the national service thing. It's it's the same as uh, being called up to go to the army and then asked for volunteers to become a paravet or to become a reconnaissance commander, or whatever. And in the navy, the um, the navy divers course was a um, extremely intense two and a half month course, which they obviously asked for volunteers, and then it was extensive. Um, recruitment uh, process. Uh, I, was, I was a very good swimmer uh, at that stage, a young fit guy, and I passed the selection process and then it was two and a half months of hell. And uh, we passed um, the course after 10 weeks uh, going from a school swimmer to being a, a proper guy in the water. Mm -hmm. I was completely fearless of the water after that course. A lot of deep dives, a lot of diving um, and being uh, messed around by the instructors. I had an octopus pushed in my face under my mask at uh, 30 meters and my air taken out of my mouth at 30 meters and I was not allowed to do anything but take the octopus out, put my mask on, clear the mm -hmm. mask, clear my demand valve and uh, carry on breathing down at the bottom of the ocean in False Bay. That, that happened regularly on on a daily basis during the course. So it gave you a lot of confidence and eventually mm -hmm. when the instructors started putting shells in your wetsuit and taking your mask off and turning your air off, it was just, I wish this guy would go away sort of thing. And then that's, that just shows how good the training is mm. or was in the SADF. Yeah, I love people have mentioned that, is that mm. the training in some cases, especially with like three two that I've heard that it was actually more than adequate for yeah. for those situations. Well, our Air Force was world renowned mm. for various things: the uh, aerial combat maneuvering, ACM dogfighting, if you could call it, to the, for the layman, was uh, of the best in the world in the day. And um, I'm sure that our helicopter operations were up there with the best in the world for mm. um, close air support and. Um, special forces deployments and extraction, hot extractions when people were in trouble. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I see you brought some kit in. Well, it's very interesting. So maybe, I mean, if you can explain, maybe just pick it up and bring it close to this side. Uh, the pieces. And well, that's out of the frame, but this was my helmet that I used when doing maritime operations. It was a uh, an Impala helmet the guys used to use it on impalas but it had an oxygen mask on it which mm. I took off and adapted by um, putting on the helicopter microphone. Mm. Uh, it was just a lot more comfortable. It also had um, two different visors, mm. a yellow one which I took out. Uh, it was also lighter than the green uh, helicopter helmets. Um, also it was white, I wouldn't use this in operational area. Mm. <laughs> white would make a target in the cockpit. So it was very much my maritime operation um, work. Um, our favorite little kit gloves, all the pilots were issued with these gloves, which mm. were dear to us. Uh, Manage for protection in case of a fire. Uh, this was my ceremonial sword, which I was supposed to hand back, but as a <laughs> senior officer, I left as a, a major. I decided uh, I was going to uh, keep it. Mm. Uh, the overall that I have here is a, the, also the maritime operation overall. Okay. Um, orange, obviously, to uh, yeah. be easily detected in the sea if you fell in the sea. Um, this was the 19 Squadron badge, which was the uh, Air Force Base SWAT Corps badge. Uh, that was the squadron that I served at for three years. Uh, what squadron was it? Yeah. 19, 19 squadron, they flew Pumas. Okay. But that was the um, the border war mm. uh, squadron. And the maritime squadron was the 30, 30 squadron in Cape Town. And we wore these orange overalls mm. when we did operations over the sea. Um, that's my Navy diver badge. Uh, thousand hours on helicopters in those days. How many hours did you do in total? I had about uh, just short of 2,000 hours on helicopters when I left um, the SAF. Um, it was the 6th Squadron badge uh, from uh, Port Elizabeth where I flew in Poland Mark 1s. And there's my Southern Cross medal which I received for uh, rescuing the SAF Gullis. But many, many happy hours mm. wearing it. Very impressive, I mean. Yeah. Oh. 
Um, I think it's uh, shrunk with age because <laughs> it doesn't fit me anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, unfortunately, that is what happens to this type of fabric. Yeah. It gets <laughs> smaller by age. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. Um, any other things that you want to maybe tell us about just interesting stories? Mm -hmm. I mean, camaraderie, mm -hmm. anything that's relating to um, your operational time before we move towards maybe more your yeah. civilian and, and close off the interview? Well, um, pilots are a brotherhood. Um, pilots all around the world, and I flew extensively internationally when I left um, this, the Air Force. I went to South African Airways for 31 years, and wherever you go around the world and the pilots get together, we obviously go through the same selection process. You need the same type of temperament to deal with other people in close confines in a, a flying environment. But my close friends are my helico helicopter pilots. Mm. Yeah, uh, I've heard that before. It's a unique brother. Yeah, no, yeah, the chopper guys are good. Yeah. Special. Uh, my uncle, he's American, and he he flies um, also mm. for Delta Airlines. But yeah. He flew military in that, and yeah, uh, he's mentioned similar things as well. I think it's mainly because we always flew in pairs in the operational area and um, I knew that the chap that I was flying with if mm. he was flying uh, next to me or if I was flying with another chap that we'd rescue each other if something happened if one of the guys got was injured or shot down or so you'd go in and help your buddy yeah you mentioned earlier and maybe I just want to backtrack to that the formation flying that you were what was the reason behind that and was it always, you said five, five in a formation or? We were eight in a formation. Eight in a formation. Yeah. Mm. So you had the lead aircraft and then you had his wingman mm. and the third one in the formation would have his wingman. Mm. And that particular day uh, we were escorted by two gunships when John Twaddle got shot down. Mm. Um, so, so hopefully they would have wrecked uh, the area mm. first but they obviously missed this huge swapper base. Mm. So that particular day we had uh, basically four Pumas in, in a line with mm. their wingmen also in line, sort of about 400 meters apart. Not ideal, but mm. I don't know how else you'd yeah, fly a yeah, so You mentioned now for the people that don't know, you, you say gunship, so yeah. what is that? The gunship was the Alouette mm. uh, 3 helicopter, which the um, Arms Corps mounted a 20 mil machine gun in the door, which pointed out the side, mm. which was operated by the flight engineer. Okay, so if they need mm. to suppressing or, or sort yeah. of problem out on no, the ground. That created much terror on the ground because um, the enemy was very reluctant to shoot at the Alouette helicopter because if they were detected on the ground, it was definite death because they had a high explosive round in the 20 mil, so they. He could hit the ground, the flight engineer, anywhere near the, the uh, enemy on the ground and he would have been um, killed by the exploding round. Okay, and then how long was your hmm. total service in, in the Defence Force? I spent 11 years in the SADF, yeah. Nine months in the Navy and the rest was in South African Air Force. Hmm. Uh, so I was the first group of pilots to sign the flexi service contract which is a 10 year contract and as soon as my contract was up um, I basically finished the contract or retired from the Air Force and uh, was selected to fly as a pilot with the South African Airways. So what year was that when you exited? 1989. 89, okay. Yeah. And then you said you flew for 30? 30, 30, 31 years and then there was the start of COVID. Um, I did the second last flight out of New York in an Airbus 350 and was told to go home and they'll phone me and then COVID as we know mm. destroyed world aviation and that was the end of my career. Sure. So it was a two year premature retirement. Yeah, I mean a abrupt end, I mm. can sort of not planned. I mean that yeah. alone must be, you know. And yeah. yeah, so maybe let's look at your your civilian time and, and I mean it's mm. maybe for for this project that we're trying to do it's mm. not as applicable but I'm quite interested in maybe your your civilian flying time and I mean like working in SAA, I mean it's unique, it's a very I mean prestigious airline that's got a long and rich history to it and I think mm. I mean, especially pilots, I mean, you must be proud of that, um, in that lineage. I mean, obviously they've had 
massive problems mm. now lately. Um, yeah, well, but, in the, I in mean, the, what made it fun? What did you enjoy about being a pilot? Or <laughs> well, South African Airways in in the eighties um, was an extremely safe and um, the training section at South African Airways in those days was the, of the best in the world. The South African Airways pilots invented um, the Cat Three monitored approach, which is a very bad weather, a zero forward visibility approach in landing which the rest of the world followed on shortly after that. But the SAA pilots in, in the 80s developed it and it was recognized by all the other, um, the FAA and so on. And uh, when I joined SAA, it was a very, very strict and rigid formal um, unit. I think there were about 600, 700 pilots in those days. Um, and then I stayed on through the co-pilots, uh, era domestic as a co-pilot, international as a co-pilot and then um, moved into the left seat as a captain in 2002, 2003 where I was also an instructor so I stayed on as a flying instructor as a captain uh, for nearly 20 years that is a finished my career as an international captain, spent the last uh, 10 years as an international captain Instructor on the Airbus 340, Airbus 350, the new one we uh, mm. trained on right near the end, and the Airbus 330. And just a particular route, or mm. did you just alternate the routes? Or? Well, I used to um, enjoy going to places where they didn't speak English. So I really enjoyed going to the Far East, uh, Hong Kong and Sao Paulo. But um, America was always a challenge. Uh, Europe is always a challenge. Germany was one, you know, Frankfurt and Munich. Mm. Were right up there, my favorite destinations. It's a long one, man. Yeah. I've learned that, especially in my time in government as well. We mm. a few times had that long haul with SAA to the US and that. So well, um, coming back from New York, yeah. And yeah, with a 340-600, we used to fly direct. Mm. Um, taking off with 155 tons of fuel and landing with six tons of fuel in New York in bad weather with mm. the. Uh, your alternate airfield is just across the Hudson River, which uh, made it quite exciting. <laughs> Especially after 16 hours of flying, you weren't at your best. Yeah. But that's why we used to take a double crew, two captains, two co-pilots on those long international flights. Yeah. Same with Beijing. and Hong Kong was also a challenge because the, the time change was so huge. We'd uh, take off at 7 o'clock in the evening in South Africa and you'd land at 1 o'clock in the afternoon in Hong Kong. And you're, your body and your system is not <laughs> ready to be uh, uh, wide awake. You're supposed to be sleeping after 12 hours, mm. but it's broad daylight. So your eyes absorb all the light and your brain says you should be awake and your body's telling you you should be asleep. And <laughs> yeah, crazy. You never get used to jet lag or sleep deprivation. <laughs> yeah, the guys have to deal yeah. with that I mean, on a weekly basis. Yeah, well, we used to do two to three flights a month yeah. on the international. Great fun. Yeah, loved yeah. every minute of it. I'm sure it is. I mean, it's an incredible profession, and yeah. especially if you love. I mean, I'm sure you loved it, your job. I mean, yeah, no, it was incredible. If I had my life over, I'd do exactly the same. Ah, great. And I'm assuming you you married and you've got kids and that. Yeah, I've got two lovely kids. Mm. Uh, two and a half grandchildren. The next one's been born next month, and yeah, we live in Port Elizabeth. Life's mm. good. Yeah, maybe just the last question. Um, I mean, the purpose of now this project is preserving the memory, now mainly with, with 3 2 related, but I'm quite keen to almost look at how you saw your period there. I mean, maybe, I mean, with the Air Force pilots, it's a little bit different. Um, but I mean, I never served, and I think. Mm. One would be very proud of that and always want to see if how the narrative will pan out and the, the following generation will look back at that period. Um, so my question is, yeah, I'm sure you, you're proud of that, that you've done and maybe just, uh, you said you will do it over again, but there's nothing that one did at that period that you have to stand back for or apologize in that sense. 
No, I was a, I was a pawn of the government. Um, and I think that most of the pilots that were in the Air Force then were doing it purely for the love of the flying. Mm -hmm. I don't, we had nothing to do with politics and it, uh, they didn't come into it at all. It was the thrill of the flying helicopter and mm. being with our friends and um, going to different places and going to Antarctica and Marion Island flying off ships. And that was the thrill. Um, I was committed to 10 years in the Air Force. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Mm. Thank you very much for, no. for giving us the opportunity to do this interview and best yeah. of luck with your retirement and yeah, the Thank next you. stage of your life. Thank you very much.